Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome everyone. This is Doriel Inez Larrier of Larrier's Education and Resource Network, where I plant seeds to help you grow. Welcome to another episode of The Digital Couch, where we have inspirational leaders uh, inspire, impact, and inform their communities to live life better than they did yesterday. Tonight is a new series. Even though it is the middle of the year and most people are on a particular holiday, we are gearing up for the fall when a number of people will be looking at classrooms, at education a little bit differently. And so tonight, to lead off this new series called A New Class is in Session. I could not have begun this with none other than a good friend of mine and a classmate, actually, and that is Dr. Frank Tuitt. Uh, some of you know that uh, I attended a college in New England and uh, he was the person that was on the scene when I got there and ushered me in and through and without his wisdom and strength and intuition got a number of us through. And so the title for this this new series, again, A New Class is in Session, I thought over the past couple of weeks and months, as a number of people have, how we're going to go back into not just a building, but into a new way of thinking about education and as it moves us from point A to point B. And so to have Dr. Frank Tuitt on the digital couch tonight is part and parcel to how we need to start thinking differently. Welcome, Dr. Frank Tuitt, welcome. Thank you, pleasure to be here. All right. So we're gonna start off just with a little uh, way back when. So way back when, uh, Dr. Frank, to it and I were uh, on the green in center, or like a central Connecticut, and he has sort of hopped across the country, and then sort of made his way right back home again to an extent. Uh, started his work at Connecticut College, was education at Connecticut College, moved on to Harvard Grad School, and interspersed in that made some other moves in the field of diversity, equity, and higher education particularly. He has just spent, uh, if I'm not correct, 10 years? Is it 10 years in Colorado? 16 years in Colorado. Oh, geez. So <laughs> 16 years at the University of Denver. Thank you, right, University of Denver, and has done a lot of critical work in looking at issues of diversity in higher education in the spaces where not just the people who have, I'll say their, their bodies in seats, but the educators who are inspiring them and moving those students onward and upward, but also the policy that surrounds getting people in through and moving them forward to be leaders and educational thought educational thought leaders in the community. And now uh, Dr. Tuitt sits as the vice president and chief diversity officer of the University of Connecticut. So left Connecticut, went west and came back. And uh, as well as the professor of higher education and student affairs at the Neeg School of Education. Did I get that correct? NIAC, but yes. Oh, NIAC, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud to to have him with us. So huh, is there anything that I forgot for the part no, of the question? No, you, you got it all. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So first thing I want to say is uh, those people who are popping on, whether you're here live or on the replay, I need you to do two things for me. We need for you to not only, of course, if you do appreciate the information, then, you know, send some shout outs. We are broadcasting on Facebook and on YouTube today. So uh, you can drop any questions, you can drop any thoughts, and I'll do the best I can to navigate and moderate the conversation and any questions. In addition, we would love for you to invite people who you know, whether they be from 
the field of education in general, the field of higher education, any people that you have delved into the topic of maybe you know critical race theory, that's a hot topic that we are hearing um, over the past couple of months. Those people who are uh, concerned about the, the souls and the minds of students of color from birth to 16 plus, because it, if it doesn't start in higher education, everything else sort of funnels down and impacts the lives and the futures of others. So we would definitely love for you to do that. And uh, if you have specific questions for myself or Dr. Tewitt about these, these topics, please drop them in the comments as well. So um, I'm going to also start with three, one, two, three, four texts. And I'll say this again during the conversation. If you are unfamiliar with Dr. Tewitt, please look him up. But these are four texts that if you do not have them on your shelf or have them somewhere like at least in your Amazon cart to some at some point get, you really should consider them. And that is number one is race equity and the learning environment, the global relevance of critical and inclusive pedagogies. And we will discuss inclusive pedagogy tonight in higher education. Two, race in higher education, researching pedagogy in diverse college classrooms. Three, black faculty in the academy, narratives for negotiating identity and achieving career success. And four, his most recent work, plantation politics and campus rebellions. Now, before we hop into it, even though these texts have at the center higher education, Literally, the term higher education can be swapped out and we could put any level of education in that spot because there are clearly there are still discussions, debates to some extent of are the voices of those to some may say underrepresented groups, are they heard, are they visible? whether it be in elementary, middle, high school, are they heard? What type of faculty or teachers or leaders are in those spaces or standing at the top or in the front of those classrooms or sitting in the seats of administration? So even though his texts part, uh, are about higher education, when I started reading the articles, I said, this isn't very different. <laughs> it's not very different, but we definitely need more uh, voices and, and sojourners in the field of higher education um, to lead the way. And so I'm very blessed and thankful that Dr. Frank Tewitt has decided to come and sit on the, on the couch tonight. Dr. Tewitt, is there anything else about, let's say the text that you have written that you might want to highlight even more because of what's happening in the country in the last two to three years? Yeah, I, I think just by way of summary, my, my work tries to identify ways in which predominantly white institutions can create more inclusive, affirming, equitable learning environments for historically oppressed students. And, and that's the way I think about it. And, and I would agree that uh, a lot of what I talk about in the higher ed context can be applied to the K-12 learning environment. Excellent. Uh, I do want to pop into something that you just said, and it caused a flashback. When I was in uh, undergrad, when I was in my undergrad classes, there clearly was, and I'm sure this has to do with some of the work that you've done, there clearly was this imagery that the person, of course, who stood in front of me was the leader, was the person that had all information. And those of you who are more familiar with his HBCUs or historically black uh, colleges and universities sometimes throw this at, let's say, folks like Frank and I and say, well, you know, maybe you should have gone to an HBCU that <laughs> and you probably know where I'm going, that we looked at those persons and we said at our schools and we said, wow, you know, that's the person that knows somewhere in the back of our mind we may or may not ha have had experience with someone who looked like us as an example to follow or as an example to say, yes, they're out there. 
while we were at school, when a faculty of color stepped onto the campus and while we were there, maybe we had, and I'll say faculty of administration, well, maybe like six, maybe five or six um, faculty and administration of color on our campus. And then uh, in the next few years, as a part of the work that Dr. Tewitt has done while we were college students, was to move the college and move the university to bring on, of course, more faculty of color. But when an, an additional faculty of color stepped on the campus, students of color primarily gravitated to them like, like magnets. It was a feeling of, it was like reminiscent of, you're a, a family member that I has been, has been gone very long. Now that you're back, but they weren't there to begin with, but just the feeling of, let me come and give you a hug. And the numbers did that. <laughs> and I'm sure the professors were like, I just met you. And, but they also understood that there was a gap that they were filling. And mind you, this is a couple of decades ago, but now those sojourners have paved the way. They have opened the doors and those that opening of the door is difficult and it was trying and it was exhausting. But I just wanna say from the outset, thank God for those professors who stepped onto campuses like ours uh, to be the example and to be the leader and to say, I see you and you can do it. And I'm here for you. And last but not least, if I could do it, I'm opening a door for you. So I just needed to like open the way <laughs> and say that because one of uh, the professors that we had has just transitioned. So um, Dr. Thompson, I just needed to, to say his name for the record. So let's hop into some some questions for the evening. And uh, again, those people, if you are listening and watching, if you're sharing and inviting other people who, of course, know Dr. Tewitt, or know myself and Dr. Tewitt, and where we're from, of course, invite them in. Your current role and responsibility, again, is Chief Diversity Officer at University of Connecticut. Can you give, uh, did you ever see yourself, do you see yourself decades ago at being at this point? And if so, or if you thought that you would be at this point, at some point in your career, what kept you on the path to do work like this and to be at an institution like this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so a couple of things, and it, it ties right back to you were just talking about beautifully about the impact that the, the loan, in my case, it was, there were two when I got to Connecticut College, right? Bob Hampton, Robert Hampton, and Barclay Hendricks. And uh, I didn't have the privilege of taking a class with, with um, Barclay Hendricks, but I, I did take several classes with Robert Hampton and seeing a black man standing in front of a class, leading a large lecture hall, dropping knowledge in the way that he did was absolutely uh, inspirational uh, in, in thinking about what kinds of options were there for me moving forward. As you know, we had a range of experiences at Connecticut College, which uh, I give credit to introducing me to DEI work. Little did I know uh, that that was what we were doing back then. But uh, my work has always been committed to helping uh, institutions do a better job of educating folks that look like us. And so I, I, I went to Connecticut College with this crazy idea that I was gonna be uh, a psychologist and um, and didn't make it through intro to psych, but for uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it was uh, 8.30 in the morning and somehow I had a, a challenge getting up to that <laughs> class. But, um, you know, I landed in human development and sociology and um, it really uh, provided, uh, I think, the proper foundation me, for me to think about how institutional environments shape the experiences of, of folks like us. And so uh, I left Connecticut College wanting to work in higher ed. I had some amazing uh, mentors, some who we share when you think about uh, Margie Lipschez and Grizel and Rick and other folks like that who, who cared for us, right? 
uh, when while we were there. Uh, and I left Khan wanting to to be one of them, right? Yeah. And I didn't know if that was going to be in front of the classroom or behind a desk as an administrator. So uh, I worked for a little while, as you mentioned, and then finally decided to go back and get a doctorate. And even when I got to grad school, I had seen over time how black faculty members in particular were treated. And uh, you know, I said to myself, I'm not sure I want to sign up for that, but I knew I was going to work in higher ed. And, and that's where I got introduced to the work of inclusive pedagogy. It was actually um, a visiting faculty member at, at, at Harvard named Dr. Sharon Friesbrett, who uh, saw something in me, decided to uh, make me a, a teaching assistant for her class, and then had to leave early and I ended up teaching the class. And it was in her class where I, I felt something different, right? I felt something that I really hadn't experienced in, in the academy before. Um, and that was what it felt like to be fully included as a whole human being in a learning environment. And so I owe my, my focus on inclusive pedagogy to, to Dr. Friesbrit, who uh, really created the, the sort of lab for that work to evolve and that ended up being a huge part of my dissertation. Uh, and I'll just share the title because I think it sort of captures the work as I thought about it and connects to something you said earlier. So my dissertation title was Black Souls in the Ivory Tower. Yeah, I remember. Understanding what it means to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of African-American graduate students. And it dawned on me that through that work and pulling together a range of other experiences that I had had over the decade I had worked in higher ed as an administrator, um, that what was most important was what was happening in the classroom. Because ultimately that's what we went to these institutions for, to get, a, to get some knowledge, to get a degree, uh, so that we can experience the, the American dream, sort of. So, um, so did I see myself back then being a, a professor, being a chief diversity officer? No, but um, apparently I was always on that path, right? The first uh, assignment I wrote for Connecticut College, and uh, it was in, uh, I think it's Professor Winter's class, and mm -hmm. uh, it was about how the environment either contributes to uh, in negative ways or positive ways how black students perform. And, you know, um, apparently I didn't have a really compelling argument because I think I got a D on that paper, but it was motivation to to continue that work. Right, so actually let me, let me pop into that moment because I, I think it is my thought, let me say it like this. It is my thought that papers like that, topics like that, at that time, I think the best analogy could be like a tiny knock on the door. Someone's in a house and they, you know, their ear is like a little attuned, like, is there a knock on the door? And I'm connecting that now to uh, Professor Bell. I think I'm doing it right, to Professor Bell who is the father, if you will, of critical race theory, right? And so when he brought this topic up in the 70s and, you know, coming from Brown versus Board of Education and coming out of uh, critical legal theory and saying, hey, I think there's something to this. It's not that we can't get uh, administration and professors who are smart or talented but there's probably two things. Number one, maybe those people who wanna go into those fields need support so their voices and their faces can be heard and recognized as valid. And then they need those doors open. So if he did this work in the 70s, then that might be like the tiny knock. And so of course, everyone at that time is still like, you know, we're just coming out of desegregation and, oh, everything's fine, everything's dandy. And thank God for him to say, mm, not really, just because you let us in the door doesn't mean that there's what, like there's equity, right? And so 
your work then coming later on, that tiny knock became something audible. And now, and works then 10, 15, 20 years, and now here it was like almost 30 years later, those knocks are now like huge ramming on the door. There's no way that you can ignore that just because people of all faces and, and voices are in the room that everybody is heard. And so now with critical race theory and some other pedagogies that are, are, are front and center, there's no way that people can ignore it. And so, yes, people could ignore it and say, oh, and here's something that, you know, is, is part and parcel to this conversation. Maybe you're just being too sensitive. Or, I don't see that. Or, maybe you just have to work harder. Those being what? Microaggressions. Those being micro stressors. Those being the, the 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 topic or this the statement that would make a person of color second guess themselves and say, maybe I am just being too sensitive, or maybe I'm not good enough, or and so I'm very proud that your work and the work of students, you know, your peers and let's say you know our our colleagues and I mean now peers people in who are in spaces like our school at that time, when we were moved in our heart because of the passion that we felt and we presented those thoughts, and I don't know if you did, but I know it hit me, a part of me said, is it going to be read? Not just read, like read to be, but are they gonna listen? Are they gonna take me seriously? How much do I have to do to say, I am raising my hand because I have something to say, but are you going to dismiss me? Are you going to say, oh, it's not that serious? And if I do say something and then someone else in the room tries to be dismissive, are you as my teacher going to stand up for me? So thank you for sharing that, uh, you know, that you engage in that work because a lot of other people have had similar thoughts and now prayerfully more there is no way that people cannot uh, dismiss when someone is is feeling like I really need to be heard, <laughs> especially after what has happened over the last two, really two to five years. Right. Excellent. Um, so outside um, your your last three decades, let's say, has been filled with this topic of of equity, of inclusivity of being heard, of seeing students and, and, and in addition, seeing uh, administration for who they are, not just in their academic role, but in their role as a human being of being part of a diverse population. Because a comment will can be made, of course, like, I see no color. You're just an academician or I see no color. There's You're just a student. And your work of inclusive pedagogy is highlighting that if you do not see the student or the individual according to their historical background, according to their cultural context, then you are in essence not really seeing them. Can you speak more about that? So I'll even take it a, little, a step further. I would argue that the the failure to see students for the true geniuses they are is it's not just about um, a sort of blindness there's a sort of violence that uh, the way in which that is felt on the student uh, absolutely makes it uh, one where you want to retreat you want to seek safety you want to hide and then that further complicates the learning environment. So, so absolutely, I, you know, uh, the work on inclusive pedagogy is absolutely about how do we create learning environments that allow students to be the become the best versions of themselves without causing violence or or damage to their humanity. And. Um, Unfortunately, historically getting an education in predominantly white spaces meant that we had to accept the violence that came along with that. 
Um, and the work on inclusive pedagogy is trying to show that there are alternative ways, ways that reinforce humanity of our students, that creates um, students to achieve at the highest level. And it's not about watering down or, or um, lessening expectations. If you talk to any of my students, they will tell you they have never worked harder for someone in a learning environment, right? So it's about challenging students to reach the bar that's set high and providing the resources and the support for them to, to do that. So actually, this is a perfect time for me to ask this question, which we in part alluded to, uh, and that is what is the toughest task as a black man in this particular industry? So I'm gonna paraphrase or parenthetically give another statement. When you said your students have not worked harder, add to the conversation when students, and I'll say students of color in this particular situation, when students of color walk into your room, there is, let me speak for myself. I don't wanna speak for other people, but I know other people will at least nod their head and say, yeah, me too. When I walk into a room and there is a person who looks like me, even today as the leader, me and my skin, I say, I'm not only gonna show up, but I'm gonna show up and show out why. Because although 1966, or yeah, well, excuse me, Brown versus Board of Education occurred, excuse me, occurred more than 60 years ago, there is still the expectation that I am not seen as good enough. And so the work that I have to do has to still be twice as good to be considered half as acceptable. Mm -hmm. So I am ever so proud when I see a person of you uh, at the helm. And for those people who are watching, if you are a part of our background, that you know what this means. Yeah. And that's all that needs to happen. <laughs> if you're not, if you don't understand that, don't worry about it. You can ask us later. But I do agree that uh, but the flip side, and I'm actually very, very interested in looking at anybody who's written about this. There will be certain participants who will walk into the room, see that person that, rep that is similar to them at the helm, and then say, oh, I probably don't have to work that hard. It's probably not going to be that difficult. And the the emotional battle that occurs of I'm here to I'm if I'm the leader I'm here to do a job I'm here to, to convey information and I know that the response or the attitude or the work ethic that you were giving to me would be different if I had a different amount of melanin in my skin because I, I, I experience it. Yeah. So um, there are quite a few folks who have written about this. Um, I will point you to uh, Dr. Lori Patton Davis, who has an article called Teaching Wild Black. Mm. Um, and uh, Fred Bonner has written quite, Dr. Fred Bonner, who's... Um, in, in Texas now, Texas is uh, at an HBCU in Texas. Um, Prairie View, I believe. Um, and uh, I have an article in the Journal of Black Studies uh, called uh, "Title Black Like Me," and it talks about specifically about the interactions between black professors and black students in the classroom mm -hmm. and. One of the phenomena you're describing is this notion that um, on, on two sides, one that as a student, I want to work hard for my fellow black faculty member because 
Um, I want to show that professor that I am worthy, uh, but also that it is a way of honoring their presence, right? There's also the phenomenon of, and I've been guilty of this, I will, I, I push my, my students of color uh, as a way of preparing them for, especially those who are going into the academy, for the realities of what it means to be a racially minoritized faculty member teaching in predominantly white institutions. So, yeah, there are times, and I, I, yeah, I've been guilty of this, where I'm like, I need you to, to bring it a little bit more. Because we um, have to show up. We have to show up. We, we can't slip. We can't, there's no, uh, there's a phrase, there's a song, ain't no half stepping. Yeah. We got to bring it. <laughs> we got to bring it. We have to bring it not only for the here and the now, but we have to bring it for those who are coming after. Uh, mm -hmm. And in the, in the academy, there are, I know that there are moments where you can see, let's just say you look at, at, at two papers and you see and I, we've had conversations about this for income or students incoming into the, the, the college atmosphere, not really knowing, let's say, maybe where their high school training brought them to, brought them through in terms of academic preparation, in terms of just writing, composition, you know, research, uh, citation, you know, APO, APA format. Do they have that, you know, extensive training? And I could look at two papers and say, okay. I see that this person has had the information and so I can, you know, quote unquote, grade them accordingly. And I'll look at another paper and I'll say, wow, like where is the disconnect and, and what, what needs to happen? And there's a moment of, I really want to sort of drive this home. I need for you to get this right. I need for you to show up because if I don't do it and I let you pass through my fingers or pass through my class and then go somewhere else. And someone says, oh, well, who did you have before? Oh, I had, let's say Dr. Tudor, I had Miss Larrier. And they're like, well, they let you get through with this? And, but that student only sees, why are you being so hard on me? Right. You know, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure this out. And it's almost like we have to pull the curtain back and say, we can't let you move on unless you get this right. And so it may be a little harder because you're not just, my family would say, you don't walk out in the street and represent you. Yeah. You walk out in the street, you represent your family, your community, whether you want to or not. And so we need to make sure that you show up and you show up right. Yeah, but even in those situations, we have to do it in a way where students feel loved and not hazed. And, and, and so I, I think, you know, um, when I think about one of the things I love about inclusive pedagogy is that it reminds us that we have to uh, make pedagogical decisions that lift up the souls of our students. Uh, not that's going to distort the soul in any way. Uh, right. And again, it doesn't mean we're not challenging them, absolutely challenging them, but we're challenging them in a very loving manner. Mm -hmm. You have a, you have a quote uh, that's, I don't know if you're able to pull it up or if this is just engraved in your mind or you have it as frames on your desk or something, but you have a quote that's on your page, uh, when you were at University of Denver that speaks to this, that speaks to like hearing or be, uh, viewing students of who they, of, as who they are and hearing their voices. Are you able to read that or do you have that close by? I could actually try to look it up, but. Yeah, I'm not sure which one. Not a problem. It's on your home page. Here we go. It says, we recognize our students, faculty, and staff come to us with a variety of experiences that are assets. We find ways to help them leverage those rich assets to support their overall success. Now, again, even though you're writing this or you're 
using this as like your clarion call from a higher ed perspective. This really, really trans, uh, trans, what I'm trying to say, crosses over Transcend, to all yeah. levels. Of, thank mm -hmm. you, transcends, thank you, transcends mm -hmm. to all levels of education. And so as I'm uh, working on this, this new series or this new idea of a new class is in session, given what we've gone through over the past, uh, not just two years with being in a global shutdown, and health crisis, but also the heightened awareness of insensitivity based on racial background and the the, uh, the literal and figurative attack on the black soul. What, what ideas or what thoughts can you add of how we need to look at how education, and this is education in general, but if you want to speak from the part from the standpoint of higher education, um, how does how is school going to look different? How is education going to look different? How is instruction going to look different, or how should it look different as a result of what we've been through in the past like two to five years? Yeah, there's definitely going to be a new normal. Uh, we can't come to out of an experience like this and not be radically changed uh, by it. So, you know, I, I think, uh, and there are more folks who have given attention to this, but I think the, the focus on inclusive pedagogy takes on greater um, urgency as we return to some hybrid form of whether it's in person fully or, or hybrid online, uh, part online, part in person. Uh, and, and and why I say that is because at the heart of inclusive pedagogy is centering the experiences of the students, where traditionally academy tends to center the faculty member, right? Mm -hmm. As the depositor of knowledge. And so if we are paying attention to how students are experiencing uh, this new normal, then we're making adjustments as we teach to allow them or to create the environment uh, in which they can uh, succeed at the highest level. So, um, you know, I'll point you to some of the work of Dr. Taylor Haynes Davidson, who's written about the, the online experiences and in, in terms of inclusive pedagogy and, and online environments. Dr. Saran Stewart, one of my, my colleagues as well, who uh, the both of them co-edited the race equity and the learning environment piece spend a, a lot of time thinking about how do we make education uh, or learning more relevant in these challenging times. Right, right. and I think your focus was on uh, from a problem solving perspective. Yeah, right, absolutely. And absolutely. That's, that's again where I think it transcends, uh, you know, higher ed to let's say, you know, elementary, middle, high, uh, where the problem solving focus whether it be uh, UDL um, or it is um, like reverse engineering or it is uh, collaborative environments, that these are topics and, and term terminology that's used all throughout. Um, and as we start with, let's say the higher education, even though, and I sort of work at the other, at the other end of the, uh, of the graduation line, if you will, when we look at how are how are y'all how are y'all doing it how are y'all doing it in higher ed we are the ones that are preparing young people to get to a place where when someone in in college says there's a problem that exists in society you are either living in it now and it is hitting you right now or within like one to two steps from your front door it will hit you in the face. Mm -hmm. Let's pull together the geniuses around you to try to solve this problem. I say to people even more now, I don't claim to know everything, but I claim to know a lot of great people who know more information than I do. And whereas in certain uh, theories or certain cultural practices, certain ideologies say it's, it's me and mine, you know, or it's um, each man for himself. Right. We're trying to shift that thinking to, and who, who would have thought 
that tw- at the end of 2019 being all for one now really needs to look at uh, needs to look like all for all i'm not doing what i'm doing just for me but if it's not for my neighbor if it's not for the person across the street down the block or my supervisor or the person across town or someone across the country i may not still be here right those people who thought that they had it all because they were being selfish now realize that as a result of the health crisis that we are still in, if they did not connect with someone near them, it would have been very different. It would be very different, whether it was the phone call. You know, you and I shared a phone call during this period of time just to say, hey, are you okay? Hey, are you okay? Uh, What's going on by you? Do you know about someone that we know? How are they? People could not be by themselves. And so even in even in um in this work, cooperative education or bringing geniuses together is what we're trying to do throughout education. That sitting in a cubicle to an extent and just being by yourself doesn't work for all industries. And especially when you're dealing with people, you have to lean upon the genius of other people. So I'm glad that. Uh, the working and that we're trying to do uh, in our buildings, we'll say downstairs, is helping to prepare folks when they get to you, which is upstairs. Yeah. So uh, just one one thought on that. I think cooperative learning is has been around for a while. Uh, it is a core element of inclusive pedagogy, recognizing that learning happens in relationships. And in particular, learning happens in trusting relationships. Right. And so in, 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 in my classroom, I'm trying to build micro learning communities as well as a large classroom community that is one that's built on trust and, and transparency and structure, um, but also uh, is flexible and dynamic and, and engaging. Um, so that folks recognize that their ability to succeed is not solely dependent on themselves, right? So in my classes, you will always see uh, group activities, though we know students hate that. You will always see small learning um, communities within the classroom. Uh, You will always see engagements with a diverse set of texts, right? Uh, So there's so many communities that are being built, communities with your peers, community with the instructor, communities with the authors, so that learning never happens in isolation. Excellent. Um, So since we're talking about, and I'm I'm a little pressed about calling it the new normal, I really just want to call it education different. (laughs) <laughs> or education 2.0 or learning 2.0 because there's nothing normal about this. <laughs> there's nothing right. normal about this. Um, but what what do you think, what kind of, what has been the biggest win during this period that has pressed us against the wall? It could also be like how, let's say, how is social media in academia helped to shift the needle of how learning can occur. And in that, what's the thing? We lost a lot. We lost a lot, not just of, of course, people, but of access to information. There were many, many, many families from K through 16, even though, you know, people in academia are supposed to have access to to uh, technology so that they could do their work, even if even though they were in person primarily. But what is the win that you see occurred within academia? Yes, yeah, a hard one to answer because um, uh, you know, and this is my interpretation. Not, I'm sure, not how you mean it. Uh, it it's it's too early to claim victory on it. Right, it's it's uh, we still don't know. We still don't know what's in front of us. Um, so, um, but I do think about uh, 
points of promise that have come along the way. Uh, and I'll give you some maybe not so obvious examples. Uh, one, the uh, ability to learn in an environment that is not the traditional classroom has both benefits and challenges. Uh, I have appreciated, um, you know, being able to work from the comfort of my home. I have, I'm sure students, depending on their situation, because we know it's not all the same, for some students, it could be extremely challenging to have to navigate the home environment while paying attention to school, what's happening in this virtual classroom. Um, but for those who find some comfort in that, I'm sure that's been an added uh, benefit. Um, you know, my work focuses on predominantly white institutions and I underestimated the impact of the daily encounters of having to navigate micro invalidations as you physically enter into spaces that were not designed for you. Right. To walk into buildings where you don't frequently see pictures of folks who look like you. To navigate experiences as you walk across campus that remind you that you are not in the majority, even though you may be in the numerical majority, right? But remind you that this campus was built for someone else. So not having to, to navigate those microaggressive, micro invalidations um, has, was a, a surprise that I, I don't think I anticipated that I heard students, faculty and staff talk about. Um, and I wonder, you know, how much capacity that freed up for folks to be able to engage in the work. Uh, now that's not to say they weren't encounters in the virtual spaces. I was just about to like throw something in. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The built environment, it was a new built environment. And, and so you didn't have to, to navigate some of those. So actually, so on that note, uh, and then there's, I don't know how many, and I'll just say instructors. So whether they be college professors or high school teachers or elementary or whatever, because we were in it. Like no one said, I want you to track how many people have their camera on, right? I want you to, to do a little spreadsheet daily. I can give my own estimation across the year. Uh, I was blessed to be a remote instructor during this year, but I can tell you from a September to June, after about April, <laughs> the amount of faces that I saw went from, let's say, uh, let's say 90%, probably down to uh, maybe 30 uh, on a good day. But what was, since no one said like keep track, I wonder across the country, and I can only speak to the US, although I have had frequent conversations with uh, families who have who are still in this situation in Southern Africa. And so I've heard their stories as well. And we are in some families, technology was readily available, but then conversations with their peers there, many, many families and many uh, communities who are disenfranchised, not just not having a technical device, but also load sharing, you know, and just our Wi-Fi. Just if you have a community that that's a very big issue, then you think about again the greater gap that is created with with those with families um, experiencing that type of an issue. But when it comes to how many people showed up, the ability and let's drop this in. This is a term that's probably been used before. The ability to be invisible, intentionally invisible, by just hiding behind an avatar or quote unquote, not showing up. 
And if anybody's watching, I hope you're dropping some things that are just like either poignant or, or, or hit a nerve for you, drop it in the comments so that we can sort of look back and see what is it that we said or shared or questions that we've raised uh, that we should look into more probably in another conversation. How comfortable is it for people to, let's say, slide into the background? Or I'll use a, a phrase that's used uh, in communities, fade to black, which is double entendre, but you know, to fade to black where, oh, I don't have to show up and be seen. And I bring this up because I'm a part of a number of communities where I do have to, and I'll say this for the record, I am Zoomed out. I am Zoomed out, a lot of people are Zoomed out. There is, there has to be, and I, if not, I'm charging people who are listening, someone start writing about this or looking this up. <laughs> there has to be some sharing of the emotional intensity of being encouraged or forced to show up. And let's say you are the only person in the room. Let's say you are the only person in the class. What is, and when, if your teacher or your instructor, whatever said, you know, I'd love to have all cameras on, what kind of a double intensity was there on the emotions of students of color? And I'll speak of from in predominantly white uh, spaces mm -hmm. to show up. So, you know, one can say, well, everybody else has a camera off. Why do I have to have my camera on? Because you need to show up. But I already show up. Like, I, right, this is a conversation in the mind. But I already show up. When I walk into the building, I'm showing up. I'm not just showing up for myself. And if you know, we've all we've both shared experiences where, and I'm sorry I'm laughing about this, but it's just a reality of being a um a student of color on a, a predominantly white campus. If you know that you're the only person in the class of color and you don't go to class that day. There's just an additional five pound weight that's added to your shoulder. Because mm -hmm. then one of your friends will say, hey, I didn't see you in the hall, you know, let's say before or after class, I was looking for you. Oh, I didn't go to class. I know because I looked right in that door and I didn't see any, you know, I didn't I didn't see any space. I... But that's an additional weight. And so I'm um, just bringing that up as uh, as far as part for the course. But in these spaces, I just wonder what type of relief did it give? to certain students to say, wow, this is a moment where I can just listen. I can just be here, but I don't have to be fully present. Yeah. And hopefully instructors, because everyone really was stressed out, allowed that. I will say that as people move forward with these Zoom conversations and these you know, mandatory meetings and what have you, we, the people who are like the participants in the meeting, we know that you want to show up, oh, us to show up, but sometimes we just really want to be present <laughs> without the added, you know, stress of having our face, which is my favorite line, our face in the digital space. So your thoughts on that? Oh, it's spot on. Um, we talk about the um, emotional labor that is involved, uh, particularly thinking about the challenging, highly um, um, fraught times we've been in around issues of race and um, showing up and, and being um, put in situations where you have to, whether you want to or not, serve as representatives of your race or you have to, you know, challenge somebody's stupidity uh, because time and uh, again. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, you know, there are definitely some advantages to being able to control that a little bit more, being able to manage your participation in ways that support, you know, how you're doing in that particular day and time. Um, it, it's tough to, to always have to be on, right? To always have to be conscious about, you know, if I mispronounce this word or if I um, forget a date or if 
I used the wrong citation. You know, that's going to be a reflection not only on me, but every other student of color that um, present in the future. So, and this is a this is a question that I have uh, asked uh, over the past couple of, mm, I'll say, the last few years, without anybody really taking the time to think about it. And I'm not asking you to give me the answer. I'm just trying to add it to this conversation. So, for those of you who are here, uh, those of you who are watching again, either in in live or Memorax or like live or the replay. It's something to think about. We were, and I'll say we, so Frank and I, and you know our, our other colleagues, excuse me, Dr. Tewitt, thank you. Uh, you earned it, so I'm going to use it. And I said that to you when you actually, when you got your doctor, I said, I will now call you Dr. Tewitt. And you're like, no, call me. I'm like, no, you earned it. We're going to do that. So we were raised in during a decade or during a decade where annually, it was in the 70s, 70s, early 80s. There was one show that every year our family sat and watched. And that was Roots. Did you go through that? Yeah. Okay. okay. I don't remember how old I was when I first, my family, you know, we first watched it. as, But I guess because of the year that I was born, I must have been about eight, maybe eight, nine. This couples with the talk, right? There are books that are written about the talk. There are articles that are written about the talk. Uh, even I know, um, and this is just comedy right now, but Blackish did a very, very good piece about the talk. And at what period of time do you have the talk? We know that we as uh, families of color, because I know uh, families in the, let's say the, the Latin, the Latin community, they go through their own version of the talk. And I can only speak through for, I'll speak for my community, but I'll sort of presume that they have their own version. Since we have to have this conversation, emotionally, families and especially parents of males, they have to have their own like come to Jesus moment about how, when, and how they're going to introduce this conversation of when you show up, you show up, of course, yes, you're an individual. Yes, you only have to, you know, uh, in essence, like right now you have to make mommy and daddy or, you know, your family, we have to do your best to represent your family well. But when we start saying you have to do your best to represent your community, the conversation of when that should happen, some people will say oh, about eight or nine, maybe 10, in some families, in some communities, in some lo geographical locations, it will be as soon as I feel comfortable with sending my child to the store by themselves. For some, it may say, well, maybe I should have it when, let's say, they're leaving elementary school going into middle school because now it's not, let's say, a safe haven. Unfortunately, this conversation, though, is has to start earlier. And this is not, again, it's not a question that you have to answer, but it's just something for us to think about. And if you do have a perspective, please add. Um, I'm always trying to ask families, when do you feel comfortable with having this conversation? Now, what happened over the last year and a half forced everybody to think about, there's no way I can ignore it, that based on race, there are different rules. I say this for connected to higher education. I remember going into freshman year and realizing that I was sitting in a room with people that had conversations who did not look like me that I never had. And so the showing up and saying, oh, I can answer that question or I have a, a, a an opinion or I have a comment to make and then my comment not being heard or my comment not being validated or the other people, including the teacher to an extent, sort of giving me the side eye and saying, like, how did you not know that? Or where did you go to school? Or how come you don't know, let's say Marxist theology or something? And I'm like, maybe because we didn't talk about it. 
So in higher education, when you have people who walk into the into the room, walk into the classroom, and you're trying to level the playing field, and you're trying to sort of, let's say, equalize everyone, creating that safe space is so critical and it's so important. Recognizing that not everybody has had the conversation. Right. It's really, really touchy when you engage students in conversations and you're like, I'm not really sure what kind of background people had in order to weigh in. Um, what are your, do you have any thoughts on like, because there's a talk that of course should, should occur for you know younger people and maybe there's a different talk that should occur for students entering into university. Um, but at what point do you think, especially given what we lived through, you know, up close and personal last year, what type or maybe at what age might you think that conversation should happen? Yeah, I'm going to resist trying to give a specific age and, right. and say that, and and I I don't mean this as a as a cop out. It, you know, you have to get to know uh, if you're a parent, you have to understand where your where your child is developmentally and if you're an instructor the same applies right you give your students or your kids access to information that they are prepared to or at least have a chance to leverage and use and so that's going to determine that's going to be based on your assessment of where they are in their journey and that's never going to be the same for any any two kids, right? So um, the hard part is, and I'm sorry to inter interject at this moment, but the hard part is that over the with all the strides that we have made, certain families think we don't need to have these conversations. Look at how good we're doing. We've been, you know, yeah. we moved to the other side of the railroad tracks. We're in a different, you know, socioeconomic status. I've made it to. I made it to the big league. I, and then there's some wake up call that says, mm. I thought I beat this. And then it shows up. Yeah, I don't think there are too many, and I'll just speak for, you know, I don't think there are too many black folks who, are, who uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some, and we, and we probably know a couple, but. <laughs> we uh, do. <laughs> um, the majority uh, realize that this is a moving target. Any day the rules can change. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you gotta have the talk. I think about it though in a teaching and learning context. Um, I, I say my goal as an instructor is to um, empower my students to be able to read the environment and, that they're in, uh, giving them the tools to do that. And the, and the larger goal is really to unleash their, what I refer to as their emancipatory imagination. Mm. Did you right. say emancipatory imagination? Mm -hmm. Whoever is watching right now, can you please type that in the chat? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to use that. I'm going to borrow mm -hmm. that. I love that. I love that. Because every day there is, you can make a decision. Either to emancipate, oh, emancipate yourself from mental slavery or stay right back in there. What are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. That's a good one, that's a good one. All right, last question, because our, our time is, is wrapping up. Uh, and this will, and for those people who are just popping in, thank you so much for, for coming in, for sharing. I see a number of people who are popping in and we will uh, respond to the comments when we finish the broadcast. Uh, in addition, the texts and the authors that have been mentioned in this conversation will be available for you. I'll go back and write down and get links for everyone. And if you give me about 24 hours, I'll try to put it on a one sheet so that you can just download and just access it and, and be able to add it to your, your own uh, professional library. As we wrap up, in five years, in five years, and we can project ourselves in five years, as a result of what we're going through right now, um, 
let's just say what's one thing that you pray educational institutions and because you're in the field of higher education, what's one thing that you pray will be added or modified? Either a theory, a practice, a, a service provider, like a staff person that could be added to the institution to say that they are taking the next step or moving closer to a level of equity um, in the institution? What what could that be? Either something that they add or something that currently exists and not just your institution, I'm talking about institutions in general, yeah, yeah. you know, but in, a, in five years, you know, 2020, so, say 2025. I'm gonna answer that, that really big question this way. Um, you know, the last couple of years have given institutions uh, across the P20 system, so preschool to postgraduate work, opportunities to um, show up in response to racial injustices that we've seen around the world. And my fear is that there has been, uh, there's been a lot of activity but I don't know that there's been a lot of change. Yeah. And so five years from now, I my you know, my hope is that we have exhibited some staying power, that commitments to becoming anti-racist institutions is not just the the thing of the day, but something that institutions are really continuing to strive for. That the efforts that are being made to create more inclusive uh, institutional and educational learning environments uh, is um, significant, deep, meaningful, uh, and that the level of um, harm that certain communities are subjected to as a result in being in predominantly white institutions is minimized. Uh, that there's a level of accountability, both for what we do and how we do it. And that the evidence of our success is in the removal of the types of persistent disparities we continue to see. Um, yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna play an advocate for the other side. Most people who are hard numbers people, and you probably know where I'm going with this, are probably gonna say, what does that look like? Okay, look, how many books do you want me to order? How many people do you want me to add to the faculty? How many new courses? Like, just give me a number. Cause if there's a number and I go for it, then quote unquote, Y'all will be quiet. You'll stop all these shenanigans. You'll stop like protesting. You'll stop like trying to take over the administration building. You know, you try to shut the school down. Like what, you'll stop walking out. What is that number? Yeah. And I'm going to end with a statement that was made by one of the administrators that you and I were both under. Uh, remember uh, Dean Tolliver? It stuck in my head. He said, when it's some, and quote, someone is asking, when is enough enough? Or how many students that need to be on the campus will be enough? He said, when I walk into Harris, and those people who don't know what Harris is, Harris was our largest cafeteria on the campus. He said, when I walk into Harris and I can't count the number of students of color in that room. That's when enough is enough. I'm paraphrasing, but in essence, just think of like, think of like a football stadium and you walk in and if it's on a regular day, you can say, oh, take me about 10 minutes or five, you know, 10 seconds. Oh, there's about 40 people. No, when I walk into that space and there are so many that I can't even count, that's when enough is enough. So Let me add to that. I say enough is enough when there are more of us in leadership positions than there are of us working in the kitchens. Mm. 
Somebody needs to write that down. I'm actually going to repost that. I'm going to repost that. That, right. Or cleaning the campuses. Right. Washing the dishes, sweeping the floors, cutting the grass. Yeah. That there are more people who show up during the daylight hours than show up when the lights go out. There you go. Oh, that's one for the books. We have had an amazing conversation. I do pray that this is not the be all and end all. I do pray that at some point later on down the line, you will join and have a seat on the digital couch with me again, Dr. Frank Tewitt. This has been remarkable. I do hope that those people who have, again, watched live or watch, will watch on the replay. If there's anything, again, that you hear that resonates with your soul, that presses you to purpose, that moves you to action, that moves you to say, even though I may not have something that I legitimately can do today or tomorrow, you can at least have what I asked for today. And that's to come with an open mind. If you've heard these conversations and these questions before, but you have not necessarily engaged in deeper thought, not just like, oh, that'll be over or that's someone else, for someone else to do. No, that's for us to do right here. So as you move from this moment to the next moment, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, Pull someone aside and like ask them the questions. Are there enough people in these spaces? Does it matter when my child or my niece or nephew or my grandchild shows up in school? How am I going to treat their instructor? And this is particularly of this conversation, their instructor of color. Am I going to make it harder for them? Am I going to press them harder because they are of color and say, well, you better and you ought to. and you, Or am I going to at least start off with this? Start off with that because we need that. But then also tell your child or your niece or nephew or grandchild or the child that you, you know, give a pat on the back with at church or the community center or even on the street. Do you have a, a teacher or a faculty of color? Make sure you show up for them. Make sure you treat them with respect. They are working twice as hard to be present for you. Don't take advantage, but if you need support and you need help and you need them to just hear you, they are there for you. Whether or not they're your direct instructor, if you see them in the building or on the campus, know that they are walking that campus, they are in that hall, they are on the board or the committee so that they can be a face for you to look at to lean on and to follow if you so choose. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I do hope that you would share this with someone else if it is uh, a passion of yours as it is of Dr. Tewitt and myself. Uh, we look forward to having additional conversations during this week. This will be a week long series. So tomorrow we will be speaking with uh, Leslie Joan Sessler uh, on unschooling and that whole, that entire theory, that entire mood, which is a very touchy subject, uh, but it, as a result of all those families who have had to homeschool, so she'll be addressing homeschooling, but then a deeper issue of unschooling. On Wednesday, we'll be uh, chatting with Dr. Sh Sharon Smith-Sanchez about trauma-informed education and trauma-informed instruction and how to how families and children need to be supported as a result of what we have gone through. And last but not least, we will this week we will be just uh, chatting with Dr. Norin Lane Moffitt, who will be uh, who like Dr. Tewitt is in higher education, and his field has to do with supporting doctoral students, supporting doctoral students or students doing their dissertation in the field of education and in the field of education for the purpose of critical race theory and transformational work. So I do hope that I've tried to curate as much information uh, that will move the needle forward for us. I wish you well, peace and blessings. This is Doriel Inez Larrier of Larrier's Education and Resource Network, where I plan to help you grow. And thank you for joining us on the digital couch. Good night. <laughs>